ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. James Bradley is the author of several best-selling works of fiction and non-fiction. And James begins his new book with a quote. A quote from Arthur C. Clarke, the writer of 2001 A Space Odyssey, who says that now that we can see our planet from space, it seems kind of inappropriate to call it Earth when clearly it is ocean. Such is the immensity of all that water that rolls around on the surface of this planet. Like so many of us, James Bradley grew up near the ocean, walking across the hot sand to plunge into the waves and water throughout his childhood. And for most of his life, he's been writing about the ocean in one way or another. And now at last, James Bradley has delivered a great grand book on the history of the deep through deep time. He gives us some answers to deep questions that have always niggled at me since I was a kid, like, where did all that water come from in the first place? How come our planet has oceans and Mars does not? To write the history of the ocean is also to write a history of human beings and how we've fished from it, sailed across it, and unloaded our trash into it. And in his travels, James has seen up close the many-faceted crisis that's carrying us all into what he calls an age of emergency, but he doesn't expect to recede in his lifetime. James Radley's book is called Deep Water, The World in the Ocean. Hello, James. Hi, Richard. You're an Adelaide boy originally. What's your earliest memory of the ocean? Uh, I'm actually a Glenelg boy, even more than an Adelaide boy. Is that a thing? Like, as not a Henley Beach guy, you mean, as a, you're a Glenelg oh, guy? Oh, yeah, the beaches are different. <laughs> um, you know, I, look, I grew up in Glenelg in Adelaide, which is, I guess, the Bondi of Adelaide in a low-key kind of way. And it's a funny suburb, but we lived about two blocks back from the water. And it just meant that you were there all the time through your childhood. We, we swam a lot. I snorkeled a lot. We used to go fishing off the jetty. We'd go crabbing off the jetty. We'd jump off the jetty. Now, back in those days when guys jumped off the jetty, they could take their shirts off, but they had to keep their jeans on. (laughs) So in the middle of summer, you'd have these guys wearing skin-tight black jeans, up leaping into the water with a beer bottle in one hand off the jetty. Um, Right from when I was very young, I had that very close affinity and relationship with the water. And a number of my very earliest memories, in fact, are about the water. What's the coastline like around Adelaide? Well, it's a long, sandy beach. Uh, it's been broken up over the years by breakwaters and things, which is a, there's a kind of sand cycle that moves around the Gulf, and that's been broken up, so you get kind of sand gathering in various places. The thing that's really interesting to me about Glenelg, where I grew up, is that that landscape, you know, and it's really written into me. Like, I was down there a few months ago, and and I look at that stretch of coast, and I just know it. In myself, and to me, it looks like an entirely natural landscape. And the thing that's fascinating to me is that when Europeans invaded uh, nearly 200 years ago, it was a completely different landscape. It was lagoons and wetland, and you know, now it's kind of sand hills and beach and rock fronts. There's something about the complete transformation of that landscape which I find really fascinating. Do you think it makes Australians, by and large, being as we are very much a coastal people, that's not to discount the experience of people who live inland, of course, but most of the population is on the coast. Do you think it makes us quite distinctly different from Europeans, for example? I think it probably does. And I think it probably does in both good ways and bad ways. I mean, I think there is an affinity with the water and and a kind of sense of the coast as a place of relaxation and release. Is there something primal about being in the water that applies to all humans? I mean, there are a series of actual physiological things. So when we go under the water, our body, uh, a thing called the mammalian dive reflex comes into play and essentially our bodies begin to change. You, know, you, you get blood shunted away from your extremities to the middle. And, and it's one of the things that, that free divers use when they go down. So, so when you're one of these people who dives in the water, you, you can kind of rely on that. But there is something really instinctual and I guess kind of innate about that relationship with the water. It's fascinating to me how quickly we think about once we're thinking about dreams or creativity or any of those things, all of those words, all of those ideas are about flow, they're about liquidity, they're about continuity of change. I think also one of the things that is very fascinating to me is that so many of the stories we have about the creation of the world begin in water. 
you know, you look at the Bible, you know, there's the light moving on the deep. You know, the, in a number of the Islamic stories, you have you have a kind of great ocean, you, you have a similar kind of thing in, in a number of the, the Hindu stories. And if you look at lots of the indigenous stories from various cultures, they will involve a kind of liquid world of some kind. So there's something about the unformed nature of water, I think, which allows us to allows us to make things out of it and see order coming out of it. In the 7th century, when the Arabs were breaking out of the Arabian desert and creating, conquering their first empire, initially there was a lot of uh, scepticism and fear from the men of the desert about building a navy, which eventually they did and went on to dominate the eastern Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean maritime trade routes and the like. But initially the men of the desert hated the idea of going out in the water and one of, them was, one of their leaders said, fear it much. Man upon the water is like an insect upon a splinter. This seems to be another thing that runs through our interaction with the ocean is our awe before it, our sense of its great infinitude, James. Well, its immensity is incredibly powerful, you know, and there is this sense, I mean, the ocean is what, about seven-tenths of the world's surface, and it is immense. You know, if you look at the biosphere, the kind of livable space of the Earth, the ocean is about 95 or 90% of that, depends on how you measure it. But... I think that different cultures have a different relationship to the ocean. I think that particularly people who come out of a European tradition, there tended to be a conception of the ocean as something that was separate and something that you often were engaged in, I think, quite an oppositional or dangerous relationship with. You know, I mean, certainly there's old stories about sailors didn't learn to swim because it was bad luck, you know, and, and that fishermen hated hated the sea. There's a There's a wonderful moment in... Peter Matheson's first book, the the one about sharks called Blue Meridian from about 60 years ago. And he goes out on a ship with, I think it's a Norwegian sailor, and he's been captaining ships for 40 years. And he talks to this man and he says, do you love being a sailor? And he says, I hate the ocean. <laughs> he says, all I want to do is to go back to Norway and open a 7-Eleven. <laughs> but I mean, I do think there is that, that kind of sense that the ocean is something dangerous that takes people and hurts people is often quite embedded in a lot of European culture. Yeah, well, they're near, they're near the Atlantic and we're on the edge of the Pacific, which are different kind of oceans, aren't they? All of my childhood, is my best childhood memories are flooded with being on this, memories of being on the beach, long, long happy days of endless play and the cool of the water, the heat of the day, the sand under my feet and all of those things. And when I'm trying to persuade European friends of mine to come and visit me in Australia, Central European friends, they look at me like I'm mad. Like, why would you want to get in the ocean for, man? Do you, do you, do you notice this yourself, James? This, an aversion amongst Europeans for the ocean or when they get... Yeah, they tend to go a bit mad in it. I don't know. I think Australians mostly have an aversion to freshwater. Like, I mean, I think most Australians don't like swimming in rivers and things like that. Which, ponds. Which, no. Ponds. Mm. Ponds, no. I mean, look, I once went swimming in the ponds in London. I have to say they were the most disgusting, disgusting. thing I've ever been in my life. <laughs> I'm, never getting into a you know, pond. I'm like, how, I can't believe I'm getting into this water. <laughs> but so I'm not sure about the Europeans, but I think that you were talking before about that affinity of Australians. I think that flows the other way. I think lots of Australians feel quite uncomfortable about ponds and rivers and things like that because they don't seem clean to us, whereas the ocean does seem clean to us. To, to make an enormous generalisation there. Like I said right at the start, I've always been intrigued by the idea of where do the oceans come from? All that water involved in the creation of, of planet Earth. I know there was a very early phase in the creation of the Earth as it's kind of spun off from the sun as a ball of matter. It was called the Hadean phase, you know, like Hades, where it was this ball of molten rock, really. What do you know of how the oceans somehow emerged onto the surface of the ball of rock that is now the Earth? That's a very good question. Uh, and it's actually one of the parts of the book that was hardest to write because for a long time the theory has been that in the Hadean the, the earth was too hot for there to be water and that coupled with the impact of the planet called Theia which created the moon, that it was just too violent for there to be water there. So the water arrived afterwards in what they called a, what they called a bombardment. So comets and meteorites and things brought the water afterwards. What there was, the theory was we got the ocean from like comet snow. Is that the idea? Yeah, comets, comets and, and meteorites. And over the last few years, a little bit longer perhaps, that theory has begun to change. And, and certainly when I was writing the book, it was quite difficult because, because the science does seem to be in flux. There, there are different arguments where I've gone from. It looks now as if quite a lot of the water was there from very early. So it, so it was kind of contained in, 
in the meteorites and the lumps of rock and the dirt that the Earth formed from and that there may actually have been water on the planet very, very early, you know, and that doesn't mean that the planet had cooled down enough for there to be water. It was, you know, the, the, the water may have been at 200 degrees, but the air pressure was so high that the water was able to stay like that. So, it, so, you, so you're saying that water was always there and it sort of seeped up to the surface, got boiled off and then pushed back down again? Yeah, almost exactly what happened. So, so if it was already there in the rocks that formed it, it would have kind of come out of steam fallen down as rain, boiled off, turned into steam again, eventually it would have settled into kind of oceans. But, but as I say, the, the thing that I found quite difficult when I was writing the book was that the, every time I went back to do another draft, the science seemed to have evolved again and <laughs> every time I went back to it, it had changed. Um, but it is kind of fascinating because one of the things that happened was all water has what they call an isotopic signature. So water will have a certain number of deuterium, which is called heavy water. So, so deuterium is a, is a water molecule that is slightly different to, to a normal water molecule. And there will be what they call an isotopic ratio. So there will be a certain number of deuterium to, uh, molecules to every water molecule. By looking at that, you can tell where the water came from. And the water in the different parts of the solar system has a different isotopic signature. And one of the things that happened was once we started to actually get probes onto comets and look at them, the water on those comets has the wrong isotopic signature. So oh. that was one of the chinks in this argument that it all came from space. Now, some of it did come from space. Some of it clearly did come from space. But quite a lot of it seems to have been in the rocks that formed the Earth in the first place. Water from space. Are we still getting water from space? We are still getting water from space. How? Is it like uh, raining down on us from space? Yeah. So the comets, as they go into the towards the sun, they shed water and there's a kind of layer of dust and water behind them and we pick some of that up as we sweep through it. Are there oceans on other planetary bodies in the solar system? There are huge oceans on so many of the ice moons around Jupiter, so um, moons like Europa and Enceladus around Jupiter and Saturn, uh, Titan, uh, a number of the ones out around Neptune and Uranus and possibly even Pluto have liquid oceans underneath the ice so that the tidal flexing that you get from going around those enormous planets generates heat down in the down in the body of the planet. And because they're made of ice, the water underneath melts. And so you have these oceans that are, you know, hundreds of kilometres deep sitting under a layer of ice. But close to us as well, Mars had um, great big oceans. There was a big ocean in the northern half of the planet and a smaller, shallow one down in the south. And Venus probably had oceans as well. They, lo- they both lost them. Venus was once imagined as this swampy, wet world. But now we know it's a total hellscape mm. on Venus. It's, it's, it, it, it's almost like it's going out of its way to hate human beings ever, ever going there. Crushing atmospheric pressure, 450 degree heat, clouds of sulfuric acid. It just hates human beings. I'm, I'm taking this very personally from Venus, James. But was it more benign once in this era when it had oceans? Well, it must have been. In fact, it's very much like Earth, Venus. I mean, it, 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 it's very similar in terms of its size and its composition. It probably had liquid, I mean, it clearly had liquid water on its, on its surface. And it underwent at some point a kind of runaway greenhouse effect. And I think there are debates about why that happened. Um, one of them is it's about the kind of changing luminosity of the sun, I think. And so as that increased, you just got a kind of feedback effect happening. More recently, there seems to be some research suggesting that, in fact, there was a massive volcanic uh, event a bit under a billion years ago. Like and, a supervolcano. Yeah, like a supervolcano. And a bit like what happened at the end of the Permian on Earth, but even worse. So what you got was this kind of runaway greenhouse effect and, and in a sense, the planet just killed itself. And there's a kind of question about whether, given it was so much like Earth, and the same is true with Mars, whether there was life there, because life evolved on Earth quite quickly. You know, so maybe these oceans had living things in it. There's actually an absolutely fascinating discovery a couple of years ago, and they found a molecule which is on Earth only associated with biological activity, and they can't, they don't know any other pathways that will produce it in the clouds of Venus. So some researchers think that although everything, I mean, down below it is the most unimaginably hostile environment, that perhaps up in the clouds there is still something floating around some kind of organism or biological process. I don't know how sound that science is, but it's a lovely idea. I know. I want it to be true, James, <laughs> just like I want there to be alien fish beneath those frozen oceans on Europa and places like that too. Oh, giant, giant octopuses and squids. I'm, right. I'm sure of it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a Jules Verne world after all. That would be wonderful. 
life emerges, as you say, within the oceans of, of Earth. And we go from unicellular to multicellular uh, life forms. How strange are some of these early life forms that appeared on oh, Earth? Oh, deeply weird. I mean, in the very early ones, even the kinds of divisions that we are used to making between animal and plant are quite difficult to make. Like, what are, what are these things? And, and I don't think they really, un, they really understand what a number of them are. And, and certainly you have things where lots of things that we are used to around kind of the symmetry of bodies, the way animals on Earth are kind of divided now down the middle. Most of us, you know, we have... We're symmetrical. We're symmetrical, but, you know, you, you have things built around kind of hexa- hexagons and, and it's a very, very strange environment and, and one in which you see all kinds of odd creatures. I mean, in an odd kind of way... When you look at the things that live down in the deep ocean, they have some of that same strangeness now. Like they look very strange to our to terrestrial eyes. But you also have these kind of convulsive punctuations of kind of extinction that go on. And I think, I think one of the problems with all of that stuff is it's all so long ago that you've got such a fragmentary record that it's often quite hard, I think, for scientists to tell, you know, how quickly things happened. You know, is this a slow extinction or a fast extinction? But you have this... In a sense, it's like someone, life starts and you get one version of it and then you get another version of it and then you get another version of it, which, which is fascinating. And it's all in the ocean. I mean, it's one of the things that is, I think, really striking is, and quite profound is that, you know, life happened once. We all come from this one moment and like a huge tree or a, a branch in coral, you know, all life comes from the ocean and we're all connected back to the ocean. We all carry in our genes the memory of that conception of life in the ocean and, and of billions of years of life in the ocean. We know in some parts of Australia and in the Sahara Desert in particular, there are desert areas where you see within the, the geology there fossilised ancient and possibly ancient primordial shellfish and the like. In the Sahara Desert there are these evidence, there's this evidence that, that there was once a sea there. What do you know about this sea that once existed in the Sahara, James? Um, so the Sahara until uh, six or 8,000 years ago was a marshland. So, so it was filled with water and there, so there were reeds and fish, like big fish, and there were people who lived there and hunted them. One of the things that's kind of amazing about that is that the first direct images we have of humans swimming come from a cave near the Sahara. (laughs) Really? The The, the oldest evidence we have of humans swimming? Uh, Not not of humans swimming because we know humans were swimming much long before. Okay, first 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 pictures pictures we we have of humans swimming come from a cave. In the Sahara? Near the Sahara, (laughs) which was discovered by a man called El Nasi, who is the model for the English patient in Odachi's huh. novel. And if you remember the book, they end up in a cave with all the swimmers and that's the cave. Almasi discovered this and it's in this incredibly dry, incredibly arid place. And he made this, this in the 1920s, and he made this jump, which was that perhaps there was water here. And everyone thought he was mad. Maybe the climate had changed, he said. And what we've discovered since then is, of course, the Earth's orbit is not entirely stable. So there's a kind of fluctuation that happens over thousands of years and it just wobbles a little bit. And You're talking about the, the axis, the, the tilt on the Earth's axis here? Yeah. So, so the kind of the angle that we present to the sun just shifts a little bit on a big cycle that runs over tens of thousands of years. And, and what that means is that you get kind of climactic changes happening because of that. And the Sahara essentially dried up really, really fast. So, so we kind of moved a bit. And the water just all kind of went away. But, you know, up until I think six or 8,000 years ago, there was water there everywhere. Fish started to emerge in the waters. And we know that oceanic mammals like whales and dolphins have a degree of self-awareness and intelligence. I know that's a slippery word, intelligence, but we know they're they're pretty smart. What about fish? How intelligent do fish get? How self-aware do we know that they might be, James? So I think fish are really interesting. I think... Lots of humans don't think of fish as being intelligent. I'm always very struck by people who decide they're pescatarians. It's too cruel to kill an animal, but it's okay to eat a fish. And there's a kind of assumption about fish embedded in that. It's because they don't have a face. They certainly don't have a face that we find very easy to to relate to. No, no, no. 
But there is increasing evidence that fish are really quite intelligent. And one of the leading lights in that space is a guy called Cullen Brown, who's actually here in Sydney. And so his early work was on a little fish called a rainbow fish. And, you know, he discovered that not only do they have a very good memory, you know, they perform better than many mammals on lots of these tests. You know, so they remember things, they have culture that they pass from one to another. What are you talking about, culture? What do you mean? So fish learn from each other and they pass it down through generations. You know, so, so they will learn things like migratory routes. They will learn um, places that they go to breed. You know, they'll learn all kinds of behaviours from each other and then they will pass it down. That is a quite clear definition of culture. If it was happening in a terrestrial animal, we'd be sure it was culture. You know, but, the, you know the, the mirror test that they've tried with, with apes and what have you? Has anyone done a mirror test with a fish? They have done the mirror test with a fish. So there are fish which live up on the, uh, what they call clean aras. And people would know them from watching documentaries. So they're little tiny fish, they're quite long, and they operate what are called cleaning stations on coral reefs. And so fish come to these stations and the ras clean them. So they clean dead skin and they clean parasites and things off them. And the RAS will have about 50 to 100 maybe regular customers who come to their place. And that's, that's how they get their food. But the RAS and the RAS remember all of those customers and they want to keep them. You know, the RAS aren't entirely reliable. So, so what they'll do is they'll eat the parasites and they'll eat the dead skin. But if they see a little bit of like tasty mucus or something that they could also eat, they might have a go at that. Mm, tasty mucus. Delicious eh? mucus. And of course, the fish don't like this because they get bitten. And, and, but the wrasse are incredibly sneaky. So the wrasse will never bite a new customer. They'll only bite a regular customer who's already coming quite a lot. They'll never bite customers if they know other fish are looking, which means that they're actually able to understand enough to kind of to think I mustn't do this because that other one will see you, which is a very high order of, of cognition. Um, if they do bite one and the fish gets offended, they'll go after it and swim around it and, 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 and try and placate it. If they get chased by a fish, they'll swim towards a predator of that fish. And they'll even, if they go over there and they see another cleaning station and that wrasse isn't around, they'll go in there and start biting all of its customers. <laughs> <laughs> but so they're clearly highly intelligent. And a group of scientists did the mirror test with the wrasse. And the RAS recognises itself in the mirror. And, and not surprisingly, many scientists have been a bit resistant to this discovery. I would point out that some of the scientists I spoke to think that that's a problem with the test, that the test isn't quite telling us what we think it's telling us. Um, but it does seem to mean that these RAS are able to recognise themselves in a the mirror. We, we know that dogs, for example, have amazing sense of smell. They have an olfactory experience of the world that's way more rich and complex than humans do, for example. How about fish? And is it even possible to imagine what a fish's experience of the world is like? And can you even try, James? So I think fish inhabit a very different world to us. Humans are also, I mean, I think humans also do a thing where we are the kind of white men of the animal kingdom. Like we think we're the standard that everything should be measured by. But in fact, fish have much more sophisticated vision than us. They have very good hearing. You know, the, they have incredible senses of se smell. Some of them can follow and use electrical currents. Some of them communicate with systems of electrical currents. Can they see colours or things that we can't? Yeah, they can see all kinds of colours. And there's a whole branch of science which is about trying to understand the vision of animals and what that means in a kind of ecological sense. But fish also have this extraordinary sense where if you look at a fish, you'll see that it's got a line along its side. And that line has little tiny, little tiny um, sensors in it. And, and, and what it does is it lets them sense really minute shifts in the water around them. So what it means is when a fish is swimming around, it can feel the water in a kind of band around itself. And that's how they do all that stuff. But if they're swimming, they all turn at one time because they can feel the other fish moving. Like it just ripples through the group. And I, I do think it's, I think it's incredibly difficult to imagine our way into a way of being that is so profoundly different to ours. In yeah, some but ways. it's really cool to try, isn't it? Well, it's more than cool. And there's fascinating work that's been done about trying to develop computer systems which will emulate what the vision of a fish would look like. So you could try and see what it might be like, what that fish might be seeing. But I actually think it does more than that. I think that process of trying to imagine our way across those borders of cognition into, into what it 
what it might like be to be the animal enlarges us in some way. It it forces us to recognise there are other ways of being in the world and that those ways of being in the world might differ from ours very profoundly but are still rich and intense and inhabited. Now, I actually think that's a very, just as it is, I think, important for humans to do that with each other, to try and imagine our way into other cultures, I think that act with animals is, is equally profound, if not more so. Encountering fish can be a kind of really interesting thing as well. To swim in the ocean can be a bit like going to another planet with alien species. Tell me about an encounter you had with a fish while snorkelling around the Cocos <laughs> Islands in the Indian Ocean, James. A big trevally, which was probably the best part of a meal long. It was a big fish and it swam up to me and I looked at this fish and I thought, it's going to bite me. It didn't, but it kind of circled around me. And, and, I, and I was actually drifting with the current at this point and moving quite fast. And this fish just swam in a circle around me over and over again for probably five or ten minutes. You know, and I, every time it went round, I was looking at it and thinking, is it going to bite me? What's it doing? But what I was incredibly aware of was that thing where you look at an animal and you look in its eye and you know it's looking at you. You know, there is somebody or something in there looking out at you. And So you were in the aquarium for a change. I was in the aquarium. But I mean, it's quite difficult with fish, as you say, because their faces and everything are arranged so differently to ours. But, but it's like that moment you get with a cat or something, where the cat looks at you and you think, hello, cat. Podcast. Broadcast. This is Conversations with Richard Feidler. Hear more conversations anytime on the ABC Listen app. You write that each night in the oceans of the world, when it is night over that part of the ocean, there's this mass vertical migration that takes place. Tell me about this migration, how it works. It's called the DL vertical migration. And what happens is that every night as it grows dark, many of the things that live down in the mesopelagic, so down below about 200 metres where the light starts to run out, rise up to the surface. A lot of what comes up is zooplankton of one kind or another, but you have huge numbers of lantern fish, all kinds of fish, lots of squid. You have this vast movement of life up from the ocean depths to the top. Why are they doing that? To feed, basically. So there's lots of things where if you're up the top in the daytime, things will eat you. So you come up in the dark and eat in the dark. And it's the biggest movement of life on the planet. It happens every single day and then they go down again when dawn comes. Up in the polar region, up in the Arctic, I think it runs in the darker parts of the year on the moon cycle as well. It's so big that it actually contributes to the mixing of the ocean. So it moves water in the same way that the winds and things do. It actually swirls the ocean around. But the way they discovered it is when they first invented sonar in the Second World War, they started using it on the ships. And the commanders started being really freaked out because darkness would come and the (laughs) sea floor would rise up towards them. And... There was this great confusion about what was going on and eventually they realised that the body of life moving up was so dense that it was registering on the sonar. It's absolutely enormous. And you have all of these creatures which live down there in the dark and up they come at night to feed, to hunt one another and to do things. And then also they transport back down into the deeper ocean huge amounts of carbon dioxide. So it's a big part of what they call the biological carbon pump. So what they'll do is they'll come up and they'll eat phytoplankton and things like that where it's light and so there's there's plant matter to eat. But also they will eat each other and that kind of thing and they take that back down with them into the dark. When they're down there on the bottom and there's no photosynthesis down there on the bottom, what on earth are they eating? One of two things. Things that drift down from the top. So you get this thing called marine snow which drifts down and, and essentially that is plankton casings, dead zooplankton, uh, droppings from fish, scales, and it all just kind of rains down and things down there feed on that. So once the photosynthesis runs out, you can feed on that. Large amounts of that marine snow will actually be bioluminescent because there's huge amounts of bioluminescence in the ocean. And one of the scientists I spoke to who's been down in a submersible to the bottom of the Mariana Trench in various places told me this extraordinary story about coming up 
in the submersible and you could see a waterfall of bioluminescence going past the porthole outside, which was actually the bioluminescent marine snow. The, the other things you get down on to feed on when you're down very deep is you'll get things like whale falls. So a whale will drift down and land on the bottom and then there's all these creatures that come in and eat it. You mean a dead whale? Dead whale. There's a whole ecology that feeds on dead whales down there. But what you also have are hydrothermal vents, which are places where you have water coming into contact essentially with superheated magma or, or rock, or, or you have subsea volcanoes and things like that. And, and what these do is they pump huge amounts of chemicals out into the water. You have things down there that can live on kind of chemosynthesis they feed on the chemicals in the same way that things up here feed on, on the light. And so you have these whole ecologies kind of growing around these vents. And no one had any idea they were there until very recently. You'll get what they call black smokers, which are these structures that will come up and essentially the superheated water coming out will bring out minerals, which forms columns. Like chimneys. Like chimneys and things, things grow all over it. The thing that's really fascinating about that to me is that we used to think that life evolved in, you know, there's that kind of notion that evolved in a shallow pool somewhere. When I was a kid, they'd say it evolved in a shallow pool and lightning hit the pool maybe and generated. Now, a lot of people think that maybe it evolved down on the sea floor at one of these vents. So maybe the origins of life are sitting down there in the deep ocean. We know that over time, massive tectonic events caused the land to poke up above the water. And are we to imagine the first continents and islands on the earth to be these barren chunks of rock until the oceans colonised it, life in the oceans colonised the earth? They were completely barren until things started to come up onto the land. And so we have footprints that they found from things skittering along the edge of the water. Huge periods of time ago, you have you know, lichens and things that start to form and move up out of the water. So you, what you would have had was a kind of movement of life up from the water. And eventually you get fish and things which start coming out of the water and and floundering around in the shallow water. I think that there are lots of things still like lungfish and mudskippers and things like that, that that are probably a little like some of those fish that came out then. So then they develop appendages so they can get about. Eventually down the line we get humans that come out of Africa and settle across all the continents except Ant Antarctica. Do we know if there was watercraft used in some of those settlements as, as humans went from one part of the world to another? Yeah, so... What we know is that a bit over 2 million years ago, you see a first movement out of Africa and Homo erectus moves out across Asia from Africa and they end up on a number of islands and places which are quite a long way, even when sea levels are at their lowest. It's possible they got there by accident. It's also possible that they were using some kind of watercraft to get there. It's very hard to know. But what we do know is that once you get to Neanderthals and modern humans... They were definitely using watercraft. The idea of Gaia theory, which was put forward by the scientist James Lovelock in the 1960s, that since we've been able to look at pictures of the Earth taken from space, we now have a conception of the Earth as this singular biological entity, as kind of a singular organism. But that's actually quite an old idea you show. There was a Roman writer who had a similar theory called Pomponius Mela. What did he write about in so, the oceans? That kind of idea of the Earth as an interconnected whole and the kind of step on from that, which is that the system itself is in many ways a living system, the planet is alive, you see coming through in lots of older philosophies. But Mela had this wonderful idea that the planet was alive and the movement of the tides was actually the breath of the world going in and out. But it's a very powerful idea. I mean, it's through almost every Indigenous culture you'll find some version of it. It's one of the things I find very striking is we talk about astronauts going up into space and having this kind of overview effect where they look down and they go, it's all one thing, it's all connected. We are part of a huge living system. You look at that and you think, well, it's interesting that seems such a profound realisation because you could go to almost any Indigenous culture on Earth and they tell you exactly that. I think the difference is you can see it in the context of being surrounded by the vacuum of space, yep. which is so alien to human, any kind of life, human life. Yeah, and I think those photos do do that very, very powerfully. I mean, you look at both the Earthrise photo, the blue marble photo, and they show you not just that the planet is this fragile, beautiful thing hanging in the sterile blackness of space, but that it's a blue planet. 
you can see that the land is not what matters. It's the ocean. It's the blueness that makes it there. There's so much water. Once we reach the age of exploration, we have the age of colonisation that follows very, very hot on its heel. And this is something that enabled something that historians called the Columbian Exchange. Scientists use this phrase as well. Can you just describe what the Columbian Exchange is? The Americas had been separated from Europe for tens of thousands of years and biologically separated as well. And you have this moment where Europeans arrive in the Americas and there is an exchange back and forth. Europeans take over horses, they take over smallpox, they take over you know, all of these diseases that kill millions and millions of Indigenous Americans. And then you have all of these things that come back, potatoes, tomatoes, chocolate, coffee. Tobacco, yeah. Tobacco. And what you see in the Columbian Exchange is the beginning of a process that you can see taking place over the next 500 years, which is essentially a biological and ecological reorganising of the planet. In parts of North America, there were no earthworms because they'd all been killed when the ice sheets were lying on top of the place and they hadn't really reformed. And European earthworms arrived and kind of took over and completely changed the nature of the forests. You have this, this really profound process of reorganisation of the planet. You see it in Australia as well, like Europeans arrive in Australia and we bring rabbits, we bring foxes, we bring cats, we bring wheat, we bring all of these things and transform the environment with them. The Black Death of the 14th century, this catastrophic pandemic. You see this as the catalyst for the age of exploration. I mean, what's the chain of events that connects the arrival of the Black Death in Europe in the 14th century to people getting out and mucking about in boats going and crossing the Atlantic and rounding the Horn of Africa? So the Black Death arrives in Europe and it is a catastrophe on a scale that's difficult to imagine. You know, somewhere between a third and a half of the population dies. You lose whole towns. It is difficult to imagine what it must have been like. But what it did was it broke the economic system that Europe had been using, which was essentially a form of feudalism, which relied on labour being plentiful and cheap. Right, and so labour is suddenly scarce because everyone's suddenly dead. Suddenly labour is scarce because right. everyone is dead. So European powers start to look outwards and they know where the richest place in the world is. It's West Africa. You know, so they know that the Africans are hugely wealthy with gold and silver so they start sending ships down there to look for it. Not only do they start looking for gold down there, but they suddenly start taking slaves as well. And you read some of the historians and what they'll say is Europeans want to think this is a story about travelling out and around the Cape of Good Hope. But in fact, that was just a kind of side effect of the whole thing. Really what they'd gone down there was for the gold and the later for the slaves. Once they found their way around the Cape of Good Hope, they suddenly opened up all of these new things. But there's a really long gap between Europeans arriving in West Africa and Europeans doing the next bit down, down to the Cape of Good Hope. So it's really, really fascinating. And you do see the beginnings of a quite different kind of economic model starting to emerge very quickly. An extractive model of colonisation. And there's a fascinating story, which is that in the, the 1400s, Europeans reached Madeira, which is an island, a group of islands out in the Atlantic, and they'd never been inhabited by humans, and they were covered in forests. They were fantastically heavily wooded. And so the Portuguese set up some colonies there. These colonies kick along for a little while. They have various disasters. Christopher Columbus's father-in-law releases rabbits on one of the islands and... Why wouldn't you? I why mean, wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? Because they make such a tasty stew after They do, a while, and they? then they have mm. to abandon the island because the rabbits have taken over the island and eaten everything. <laughs> but in the middle of the century, Henry gives them a licence for a new kind of sugar mill that's just been developed. And so they start making sugar on the island. And one of the things with sugar is that it gets made on a plantation model because its cultivation is extremely destructive. You need large amounts of water and you need lots of labour because you've got to dig for the water and you've got to harvest it very quickly and, and process it. And the processing is also ecologically really demanding because the system they were using, I, I think they needed 200 kilograms of wood for every kilogram of sugar that they produced. And so you can't run it without lots of labour. So they start bringing in slaves. And some of the slaves they're bringing in are from North Africa and places like that. Most of them are Guanches, who were the indigenous people who lived on the Canaries, which were kind of the next island group. And within 50 years, they're producing unbelievable amounts of sugar and they are raising the forests. And the islands are just transformed and then the whole thing collapses. But you have a system where you have this kind of extractive economy 
finance with money that's come from Italy, from financiers in Italy, which is creating a kind of resource frontier out there away from the centre and moving wealth back to the centre. It's running on slave labour. It's not quite what we'd see as capitalism, but you can kind of see the model there immediately. And I, I, I think sugar is one of the great engines of kind of world history that we don't think about. You watch that sugar frontier move out across the Atlantic, out to America, and, and start running all of that stuff. And there is an absolute correlation between the production of sugar and appalling labour conditions of one kind or another because of the way you produce them. You went out to the Cocos Islands, the archipelago of islands owned by Australia, way out in the middle of the Indian Ocean, but halfway between sort of Broome and Sri Lanka. What took you out there? I went out there with a group of scientists, one of whom is a friend of mine, Jennifer Lavers, who is a plastic scientist. And Jen's done a lot of work on remote islands, on plastics. And she's done quite a lot of work on the Cocos Islands, which are a group of islands essentially in a circle with a lagoon in the middle. And it is, as you say, about a thousand kilometres from land in any direction. And it sits in one of the currents that sweeps down from, from Indonesia. And what that means is the beaches that face into the currents are covered in plastic. Now, many of the beaches are not. I, I, I should make it clear that many parts of the islands are incredibly beautiful and, and reasonably untouched, but the ones that are in the way of the plastic, there is phenomenal amounts of plastic. You saw this? Beaches. Yeah. What did it look like? One of the beaches we were on, it was mostly plastic bottles and nets and buoys and things like that. One of the days... I walked along one of the beaches and tried to write down a list of all the things I could see. Thong, inner sole, net, just one thing after another. And I had this moment, which, you know, is the wrong response, I think, to have to plastic, because plastic is a kind of systemic problem. But you look at it and you realise that every single thing you touch, everything you interact with, becomes part of a waste stream. And it's it's just a very weird and dis dislocating thing. But it's so remote, the Cocos Islands. Are all these things sweeping in from Southeast Asia, from Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, it carried upon those currents? The, the islands are acting like kind of a net themselves, are they, to catch yeah, these Yeah, so, so basically the current sweeps down and it'll hit the beaches that it hits end up covered in plastic. We know there's vast amounts of plastic in the ocean, but it is very confronting to see it because it's not just the plastic lying on the top, it's the plastic underneath. But the thing, the islands are covered in crabs. Cocos Islands are covered in crabs. Many of them are hermit crabs. And hermit crabs are the ones that walk about and they have the shells and they change their shells as they grow. And what happens is the crabs walk along the beach and they spot a bottle and they go into the bottle. Now, if the bottle is sloping downwards, they can get out again. But if the bottle is sloping upwards, they can't because their feet can't grip on the plastic and they get trapped in the bottle and they die quite quickly. So they get cooked in the bottle. But what happens is when a hermit crab dies, it releases a pheromone. And the pheromone says... To all the other hermit crabs nearby, my shell is available. So the crabs all come in and go to get the shells, to get, get, follow the pheromone into the bottle, and they then die in the bottle as well. So you're talking about you're finding plastic bottles full of dead crabs? Full of dead crabs. They're, they're all over the beach. So there's containers filled with crabs everywhere, and there are some quite startling figures about how many of them are dying in this way. I've got a photo somewhere of a, of a fitness supplement those plastic containers you get fitness supplements in and you spoon them out like and put them in water or milk and it's just full of crabs. Like we're just kind of counting the crabs out of it. Then there's the Great Barrier Reef. You've been out there many times. We know all about the periodic mass bleaching events that have been reoccurring more and more often on the beach. This is something I've heard marine biologists tell me about for 20 years now, I think, James. Well, I warned it was coming and here it is. It's not going well. What kind of desperate measures did you see that scientists are contemplating or using to conserve what they can of the Great Barrier Reef. Yeah, I mean, look, there's a massive bleaching event that's just taken place on the reef. It, it, it's enormous. It's stretched over the whole, the whole of the reef. It looks like it's as big as 2016. It's about warming water and they, they can't deal with the heat. And so the world's lost more than half its coral cover in the last 50 years, I think. And that process is accelerating. It's a really inexorable process. You know, the, the water is just getting warmer. The reefs can't cope with it. The warm, you know, and reefs are very dynamic environments. They can recover from all kinds of things. But they, as one of the scientists said to me, it's like being a boxer. You can get knocked down and get up again, but eventually you get knocked down enough times, it gets harder and harder to get up. Are there efforts, though, underway to try and make the coral life there more, more able to withstand the, the warming waters around them? Yeah. So I talk to scientists who are doing a series of things where what they're trying to do is to find 
some coral are more heat resistant than others. And so even within a species of coral, so the same species of coral, if it's grown up at the north of the reef where the water is warmer, it will survive in water that is warmer than will kill that same coral down south. So what they're trying to do is to isolate what it is that makes some corals more heat resistant than others. And the idea is that if what we can do is is perhaps isolate some of those factors, what we can do is somehow help reefs, give them a bit of breathing space in the hope that we can get carbon emissions under control and actually stop the upward movement of the water temperatures. Now, they're having some success around that, but it's still a reasonably small scale process. And other scientists that I spoke to were fairly cynical, I think, about whether that is a kind of scalable solution. This is what you've documented, the warming oceans, declining fish stocks, mass extinctions, melting polar ice, gigantic plastic garbage patches in the middle of the oceans. Are scientists surrendering to a kind of despair about the state of the ocean, James? So when I was writing the coral chapter, because the bleaching story is one that I think lots of people know, I wanted to find a way of talking to scientists about how they felt about what was going on. Because it seems to me that particularly coral scientists are experiencing an accelerated version of what's going on. You know, in a sense, the thing that they study is getting destroyed in front of their eyes. And so I wanted to talk to them about how they felt about that. I mean, look, different people say different things. A lot of them are very emotional about it. But what they all say is some version of it's better to be doing something than to be doing nothing. They don't want to talk about hope in a kind of abstract sense. They want to think about hope as a kind of practice. You invest in things. You do things. You do what you can and you hope. My experience also with scientists is that most of them will tell you one thing while the microphone's on and then they'll give you a rather less upbeat assessment as soon as the microphone's off. Which is, which is always interesting because scientists, of course, are constrained by what they can show. They're constantly constrained by the evidence. But that doesn't mean that they don't have a sense of what is happening beyond that that they can't yet prove. So they'll often say to you something quite different once you talk to them. But I think that listening to them talk, I was in fact struck by, in many ways, how positive lots of them were. They see this kind of process of doing something as a way of kind of cultivating a kind of frame of mind that makes them more resilient. You show that in some ways you can sort of see this crisis as an incredibly complex interlaced network of crises that are all feeding off one another in some way or another. But really what you're showing here is it's really actually one thing. It's one big single crisis and it's a crisis of human agency. It's like the crisis of modern human life. What do you want to see here, James? I mean, if all humans were to disappear or to, for us all to reject modern life, that all these problems would start to disappear and the planet might start to heal? What do you think about all that? And I hope that's not an unfair question. To no, answer. it's not an unfair question. I mean, in fact, one of the reasons I wrote the book was it seemed to me that by thinking with the ocean, thinking about the ocean, it offers you a frame of reference which lets you, it lets you see how things connect. It kind of moves your horizons out. So you begin to be able to see how some of these things that seem so different fit together. And I think when we look at the situation the world is in, when we look at the kind of environmental crisis around it and the way that all of these, this kind of sense that all of these things are interlocking and accelerating one another and overlapping, it can be completely overwhelming. Like you just look at it and think, I don't know what to do with it, it's too hard. And, and it seemed to me that if we could use the ocean to think about that, then perhaps we might find some ways of thinking about all that. But the thing is, it's not quite a crisis of human agency. It's a crisis of a very specific economic model. And what you can see is if we can transition that model to a less destructive model, we can operate in a manner that is within ecological limits. That's a huge thing to think about, but it's certainly not an impossible thing to think about. And I think one of the things we do is we kind of say, well, when is the day when that happens? Now, when is the day when we suddenly switch from an unsustainable model to a sustainable model? But that's not how it happens. Political change and economic change happens gradually over time. It's going to have to happen quite quickly over the next generation or two, but, but you do see change. But I, I've looked at something like the Little Ice Age. We actually have an experiment we've run in real time about what happens if you put societies under climactic stress. And this kind of period in the middle of the last millennium Temperatures in Europe fall by half a degree to a degree and you have chaos. Crops fail, everything goes wrong. 
there's huge social unrest, there's war, you know, it's a disastrous situation. But the thing that's fascinating to me about the little ice age is two things. First is that not all countries do badly. Some countries do very, very well. Europe comes out the other end of that process transformed. The economies change. The way that the societies operate change. So, so you have a thing where societies don't collapse. Societies change. So there's nothing new about this. You're saying over history, again and again, world economies have altered, have changed. World systems have changed according to the threats and challenges and opportunities that the changing climates presented them in the past. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and if you look at any of the kind of emerging climactic histories of the world, you can see that climate has been a great driver. I mean, I wouldn't be saying that it's always a positive process, but what you do see with societies is they change, you know, and, and I mean, I think that that is something that we will see with ours, you know, and, and what exactly those changes will look like is going to be really, really interesting. We'll, we'll have to move away from the extractive models that we use. That, what exactly it will be, I'm not clear, but we have to move to something like that. We'll be forced to. I mean, as the old saying go, goes, you know, nature bats last. <laughs> you know? I want to just turn up the wick on the doom and gloom a bit here, James. <laughs> just a bit more, in fact, a way more to absolute catastrophic planetary disaster here. We talked about how the origin of the planet Earth and how the waters came to form upon its surface. Let's go the other way now. What's the moment when the oceans will actually disappear off the face of the Earth? Yeah, so, so the sun will start to burn through its fuel and it will start to expand. And in about a billion years from now, the oceans will boil away into space. What does that mean? Well, it means that the planet will get hot and the oceans will boil up and the solar wind will bear the, the molecules that the water is made of away. So the oceans are going to become like cosmic steam, are they? They, they will disappear into space. James, this has been completely fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. <laughs> James Bradley's book is called Deep Water, The World in the Ocean. I'm Richard Feidler. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to a podcast of Conversations with Richard Feidler. For more Conversations interviews, please go to the website, abc.net.au slash conversations. It started with a Saturday lunch. It ended with three people dead. The suspected cause, allegedly poisonous mushrooms. The cook Erin Patterson has been charged with murder and attempted murder. She says she's innocent. I'm devastated. I love them. I'm Christian Silver, host of the new ABC podcast Mushroom Case Daily, the podcast that follows the case of Erin Patterson as it happens. And if and when it heads to a full trial, we'll be there daily. To be the first to hear updates, follow Mushroom Case Daily on the ABC Listen app.